The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Crashing Glass podcast. As always, I'm your co-host, Holly Hurley, and I'm here with Jill Henley. Hi, you, Jill. Hi, everyone. How you doing tonight, Holly? Really good. I'm here, actually, with a friend of mine who also happens to be a very charitable chick. Her name is <laughs> Brooke James, and uh, hello, Brooke. Hello there. Hi, everybody. Now, before we get into today's topic, I just want to give a really quick plug for something that we're going to talk about later in the show that Brooke's doing right now. Uh, I want you to go to hikeforkids.com, and that's for the number four, so hikeforkids.com. And uh, we have a classmate who's actually hiking the Appalachian Trail right now to provide money for underprivileged children. And Brooke is the co-founder of this charity, and it's an unbelievable charity doing a lot of great things. So, you know, if you have to pause the show for a minute to go for hikeforkids.com, we won't mind. That'll be okay. (laughs) So, uh, obviously, getting into uh, talking to Brooke a little bit, Brooke has a really interesting story. Comes from here in St. Louis, which is very exciting. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell us a little bit, uh, Brooke, you had sort of an unusual path, I would say, for just any old girl coming out of high school. This is true. I um, I have a unique path in the sense that um, at 12 years old, I was actually diagnosed with the juvenile form of macular degeneration, uh, which is a degenerative visual impairment. So starting at the age of 12, I started to lose my central vision. And at this point, I operate with about 60% of my visual field. Uh, I can see out of the corner of my eye. When you meet me, you can't necessarily tell that I have a visual impairment, uh, but you can tell when I'm in class and I have massive pieces of equipment that help me get through that. And walking with me sometimes reading me the menu and things of that nature, but kind of launched me on this, uh, I guess, like sort of a philanthropic mission of giving back to people who visually did not have the same tools. Because without my adaptive technologies, I would, let's be honest, be illiterate. I wouldn't be able to read. So went to college in Maine, decided to join the United States Peace Corps, went all the way to West Africa. Uh, My baby project was constructing a school for the blind, Uh, went on to work for Helen Keller International, and I'm now working on this Hike for Kids initiative at WashU, getting my MBA and just it seems to be like vision has been my kind of guiding force uh, on all my projects. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's so great. So you know, yeah, you guess you, you you used that something that was uh, um, in your life, you know, in your childhood that was an obstacle, and you've turned that right into your, one of your, like you said, your life. Your life vision, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, no pun intended, right? No. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, that's you know, Holly mentioned hike for kids earlier, and that's really been uh, what united me with Mike, uh, my classmate. Mike is a product of child abuse, and he and I got together and we're just sitting there and having coffee and talking about how the hardest thing that's happened to us in our lives somehow became this bizarre catalyst for change and empowerment. And for me, it was my vision, and for Mike, it was his abuse. So it's. It's an interesting thing how you have a choice whether or not it can, you know, weight you down or really elevate you to the next level. So I just feel really kind of blessed that my whole family just was determined to make this a really positive thing as opposed to a negative thing. Yeah. So going through school, I mean, obviously at 12 years old to start losing your vision, (laughs) you know, how did you deal with that? a really good question um here's here's the good and bad news um both my older sisters actually have the exact same thing and so by the time it rolled around and hit me we just hit the ground running all the equipment was purchased all the professors and teachers were aware of what was happening so i have to admit that my situation compared to my oldest sister for example we had no idea what was happening the family was a little scared and for me i had a built-in support system of two women who were just all about, you know, helping me out and guiding me through it. So for me, I just think that positive spin was just there since day one. Uh, You know, the drawback and the hard part is there was never really any time to complain or, you know, have those difficult days. So it's only really getting older that I find that me and my sisters for the first time have actually started saying things like, I had a really difficult visual day today. (laughs) Can we talk about that? As opposed to being like, we're crusaders and like, we're fine. So, you know, it's... It's always changing. My vision is always changing and always deteriorating a little bit. So I'm in a constant state of evolution, I guess you could say. And is it always deteriorating? Is are there any other ups as well as downs or uh, you know, it, it, it is deteriorating. The, 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 they say this, though. I have what's called Stargardt's the juvenile form of generation, as I mentioned. Um, it's called the Rolls Royce of the visual impairment community because <laughs> I, I know it's ridiculous. But we only lose our central vision, but our periphery will always be intact. 
Uh Um, So I will always appear and be fairly functional. I do not, I do not use a dog and I do not use a cane. And the luxury of that is I get to share my story with people when I choose to share it, as opposed to, you know, when you do have that, that sort of noticeable equipment or aid, unfortunately people automatically, you know, will treat people differently or make assumptions. And for me, it's like, I just have a bit more control over my situation. Right. Yeah, interesting that you get to choose when you want to share it because exactly. you're right, it's it's not an obvious impairment to, to other people. Exactly. And I bet that's, I, a, all, that's a topic all in itself. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we could really spend the whole show on that. I, I can really always come back to you. I can <laughs> always come back <laughs> Cool. I, if I really though, if I had a dollar for every time I said something to Brooke, like, "Hey, look at this," or <laughs> like, "Could you tell me what color this is?" and she's like, "Yeah, no." I get, so- I get a lot of, "Is my makeup rubbed in?" and I'm like, "Ladies, I, I, I'm sure you look beautiful, but I just have no idea what you're talking about." <laughs> oh, that's so a lot of that, but it's flattering, you know, because it just means people forget. Which you know, I want it to be something that people appreciate about me, but I don't want it to necessarily be like a defining factor of who I am. So it's a happy balance, I guess. Wow, and what great perspective for us because, you know, just when we, I mean, everyone has obviously their strengths and weaknesses and physical and, and the like, but, you know, it's good to hear that you, it seems like you have such a great um, approach to it, but then you can also commiserate where you've got your sisters where you can say you've had a bad sight yeah. day, you know. Yeah, uh-huh. absolutely. I think everybody, I think regardless of what's happening, whether it be a visual impairment or whatever, People cannot be okay all the time. You just cannot be positive and on all the time. And for me, it's like, that's been something that's just like coming of age. I think a little bit more maturity of admitting that like I'm having a tough time is like not weakness or, you know, failure in any way, but just like a part of dealing with a loss of something and, you know, which happens to me in my vision. So. Wow. And, you, and at the same time, on the flip side, you know, you can't be upbeat all the time, certainly, but you can't feel sorry for yourself, meaning any of us. You can't exactly. feel sorry for yourself all the time either. You know, you have to, yeah. it's got to be right somewhere in the middle. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's great perspective for, for all of the women out there. <laughs> So when you, so like coming out of college, obviously, you know, through school, you were fortunate to have this support system. Obviously, I know at WashU, you definitely had to educate a little bit some of the authorities and powerful positions, you know, like people who give you your equipment, like, no, no, I really am very seeing impaired, even though I look totally normal. (laughs) Um, So obviously, I'm sure there was some of that at Maine as well, probably. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, I selected a very small liberal arts college because I knew I wanted a really tiny class. And I knew I wanted the kind of environment where people knew who I was so that I, you know, I could create some, a certain level of familiarity. I have to be honest, education wise for me and why I think I was really happy to go back to school is like a dream environment for someone who has any sort of disability uh, because it's just people there who are there to support you. You know, going, transitioning out of school and going into the Peace Corps, which is what I did right after my undergraduate degree, was like having the carpet ripped out from under me because I was so used to like, you know, especially the United States. We really are a culture that prides itself on, you know, catering to like, you know, the minority in that way. Like, how can we help and whatever. And, you know, going to an emerging country that didn't have any of those comforts was you know, besides like the no running water and stuff, that was just like an added kind of icing on the cake of, of terror of the whole thing. But obviously it all worked out, but yeah, school for me is challenging, but it's a really great audience I find. So I prefer to be in an academic environment than out in the like, quote unquote, real world. Yeah. Huh. Well, I prefer that too. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. Who does it? But, but I, but that's really, I can see that. Now, Brooke, did, did you go to um, Bates or, or Colby or one of those? I went to Bowdoin. I'm so Bowdoin? impressed with new Bates okay. and Colby. Well, I was trying to guess. I'm like, I, well, I'm a, I know the main colleges. I'm like, well, I bet she, I was thinking Bates. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, this is a phone ring. I was thinking Bates and then um, thinking that, oh, maybe maybe it was Colby. <laughs> okay. Those and are then big for, rivals, it but was it was definitely Bowdoin. Bowdoin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because Jill, you did your coaching in Maine, right? When you were working, when you worked at, was it U of Maine? I went to, I, yes, um, I went to undergrad or went to college at the University of Maine. Yes. And oh, great. That's, okay. Yeah. So I was up there for, and then I, and I, like I, I ran, I think, you know, I've talked, told Holly, I was on the track team there and, and it was just a really great, you know, thing to be part of and a great decision I made to to go to be on the team and, and kind of get back into that. So I ran meets at 
um, Bates and Bowden, I think, you know, indoor <laughs> track. That's a crazy yeah. small world. That's awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, so I have, I have a very, you know, very um, soft spot, spot in my heart for, for Maine. And, and, for Maine. And, it's so yeah. amazing. I miss it. <laughs> yeah. So I guess what I wanted to ask you next, Brooke, is that from then from Bowdoin, did you go right from your like, undergrad, you know, college experience and right into the Peace Corps and then you went to the Ivory Coast is where you ended up. Is that right? Well, okay. So here's, here's what's interesting. I applied to the Peace Corps uh, in like September of my senior year, was absolutely set to go. And they put me through the ringer for visual, proving to them that it wasn't too dangerous for me to go. Uh -huh. I mean, I probably had 11 different physicians write letters. It was, it took about a year. No, I, I guess less than a year. Um, I was on the brink of like, you know, I was on the, it was, I think it was like four days before graduation. I was telling everybody I had gone through medical examinations, everything you need. And then they left a voicemail one afternoon that due to my visual impairment, I was too much of a legal liability and I couldn't go. So like, it was such a horrible kind of like, oh my God, the federal government is telling me that I cannot serve because of my visual impairment. And my parents who previously were not necessarily on board because for obvious reasons, you know, the danger and whatever. My father turned around on a dime and was like, nobody is telling my kid she cannot do something because of this. <laughs> and we started a very intense appeals process, uh, which here by the grace of God, uh, we won. So I ended up going over and I mean, talk about like, I went into that program ready to like, I wanted some heads to roll. I was like, I'm going to kill this program. It's going to be awesome. I was like so <laughs> motivated. Um, and it really just took the Peace Corps calling. <clears throat> I actually, I did my Peace Corps service in Cameroon, still in West Africa. Okay. But it took them calling just one doctor in Cameroon who was like, I know what that visual impairment is. I believe she can do it. If we put her in this specific village, I think we'll be okay. Let's give her a shot. So oh, we're still actually very close to me and that doctor. He's amazing. So, um, yeah, I uh, entered the Peace Corps. I went straight in. It, the appeals process took about three months. Um, and I headed in in September of 2006. Okay. So, yeah. oh, wow. And it was a two, did you have to do the same commitment? Was it two and a half years? It's, it's 27 months. Every Peace Corps volunteer without negotiation, you sign up for 27 months. You arrive and you do uh, a three-month training session so so that they don't totally throw you out there unprepared. They give you three months to kind of be with your fellow volunteers. And I was a health extension agent, so I had to basically get up to date, up to speed on you know public health, what current situation was. Um, there was a lot of language training and cultural training and things like that. And after the three months... They literally, I am not making this up, but like six of us in a van and every four hours they would just drop a volunteer off with your trunk and they're like, good luck. We'll see you in the end. <laughs> wow. And then you have two years. Um, have two years to quote unquote build something. They're like yeah. build something. And it's like virtually no guidance and you're terrified because for me it was like, I just don't want to leave after two years and feel like I didn't give them anything or give back. But I have to be honest, the first three months to six months, I literally spent just listening. You listen and you talk, and I met the most amazing women I've ever met in my entire life. And I realized very quickly on that the women are really what drove that culture and drove productivity and drove organization. And then I needed to really bond with them. The problem was education-wise, none of them spoke French, which is like the official formal educational language. So I had to learn Fufu Day, which oh, wow. was you know, a nightmare because that was really complicated. Uh, but that was the only way I could really communicate with them on a level where it wasn't about me being this like foreign, strange American entity. You know, if I spoke full full day, we could kind of sit one on one. So, you know, we just did an array of projects. I could talk about those women for the next like four hours or like okay. the next day, but they were amazing. And these are women in this town, this or in 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 um, Ivory Coast. In West Africa. Cameroon. So Cameroon. So I went to, Cameroon. I actually ended up going to the Ivory Coast a couple years later. Oh, okay. that a little bit. But uh, I, I lived in a, a smaller village in northern Cameroon. So it was a village, I mean, I guess small. It was like 10,000. So it wasn't like insanely small or anything. But uh, yeah, I lived in, I lived in kind of like a cement square, like a tin roof. And all the women, like my best friends, lived in like the traditional mud huts with like the thatched whatever roof, like all around my compound, basically. These core volunteers have to have in that part of the country have to have 18 foot walls with like big barriers for safety reasons. But during the day, I'd open up my gates and all their kids would hang out in my compound and like we cook dinner together and do our laundry together. And oh, they were like my family, you know. Wow, what an experience. It was great. I miss it, actually. 
So, you know, so you were there and I mean, you essentially created a family for yourself in Cameroon and you learned an entire new language and you were a part of this society. At what point did you start to see walls come up? At what point did you start a project that became sort of what we know today as sort of what we're... Got it. Um, So I'm really glad you asked that question because a lot of times, a lot of these like foreign aid service, you know, people go over for like a month or three months or even six months. And I think it's admirable to give back in any way. But what I'll tell you is that the first six months is all smiles and people being polite. And we're so glad you're here. And how can I help? And the reason why the Peace Corps is two years is because in year two, everything falls apart. Everything falls apart because that's when you realize your projects are not sustainable. That's when you realize that people have very, very high expectations and that you might not actually be meeting them. That corruption, no matter how well you planned your project, you know, a a culture that's not necessarily corruption, but that's so impoverished, people make what we consider unethical decisions. They do because they have to feed their children. So for me, things got a little messy as a woman that whole, the power of being a foreign American wore off really fast. And the men in the village just started to get really, really annoyed. It was like, I don't, for example, like my neighbor was, you know, very abusive with his wife. And I listened for a while and it got to a point where I was like, this is my family. This is my community. I have the right to voice my opinion. And that was met with some real aggression. Um, The local prefecture, who was kind of like the head of the village, uh, he was like a government official. Uh, I started working with students. I wanted to create a school for the blind. And he, for some odd reason, really had an issue with disabled people. Really, Uh you know, and that was his thing. And and being a visually impaired woman to boot, he wouldn't see me. I'd sit at his office for hours. This went on for months. And it really, I think my hardest mission was finding the right people who want to work with me. Because a lot of people said they'd want to work with me. And then, you know, a month later, they'd ask for money or like things would fall apart. So definitely had some real barriers as a woman, but I think had more barriers as like an outsider. And also just the stereotype that Americans are wealthy and that, you know, development in the past 20, 30 years has really been about just giving things give things and give presents and give money, which is, you know, listen, money makes the world go round and I get that. But Peace Corps volunteers are not there to give money. We're there to give like time and, and sustainable skills and education and things like that. So there was a lot of confusion on that front. Um, in the end, I think we succeeded. I walked away. We had started a very large pharmaceutical distribution company in the women's center that I had to build three times, three times. It crumbled twice. Like literally every time it was like, what went wrong? What can we do better? You know, you think you got the right people, but you just didn't get it right that second time. And the third time, you know, we're four years out and it's still functioning. So, you know, knock on wood. Um, And the School for the Blind continues to go on. And it's because of one individual who is like a saint and he's motivated and he's brilliant and he wanted to make it work. So it's just about finding the right people, I think. So the Women's Center that you started, what what was the what, what does it do? What's the theory behind it? So the problem is Cameroon is like actually in the top 10 most corrupt countries in the world um, for, on like you know, the general rating, whatever it is every year. And they warned us about it, but like, whoa, like really <laughs> living in that kind of corruption really kind of changes your whole perspective on um, when people complain about the United States government. I'm like, don't get me started. <laughs> oh, I- um, but I arrived at this women's clinic. When you arrive in your village, they technically... The Peace Corps hooks you up with like a local, they're called your counterpart. And uh, my counterpart worked in, I'm, I'm going to quote the women's clinic because it was a cement building with nothing in it that was getting, you know, $30,000 a year and nothing to show for it. Um, it had a couple computers from like 1992 in it, a couple benches and uh, a microscope from like 1987. And that is all that it had. So my mission was to figure out where the $30,000 was, which, you know, it's a a real safety issue. Like, I can go in there and be like, guys, where's the money? But, you know, we're talking about a lot of really powerful people who don't like the fact that I'm there and I'm a young woman living alone. So it was about diplomacy meets repetition meets just being a pain in a lot of people's rear ends. So uh, the women's clinic by the end with a couple finagling here, you know, at a great microscope, we painted a bunch of educational murals on the walls because there's such a lack of opportunity for art. People would just stop by who were like walking through the village and we got to talk about nutrition impromptu because we painted like the house of food, you know, the nutritional pyramid or whatever on the wall. So wow. it was some creative things. Uh, the big project was really the pharmacy. You can ask people to come and you can ask to treat them. But if at the end of the day they have a fungus or they have malaria or they have something and you cannot treat it, 
there's no credibility as a health center. You know, it's like you have this and that really stinks and good luck. So we needed to get the drugs in. So that was really my main focus. Uh, and by the time we left, it really was just a massive pharmacy that had a couple things, you know, on the like, different branches. How did you get the drugs in? Well, that's a good question. Uh, basically, <laughs> if I, I be so bold, I mean, it's wait, like, oh, did you ask where the drugs yeah, came from, uh, Holly? Yeah, yeah. No, the yeah that's what I'm from? asking. Yeah, Wait, how did you get the drugs in? From where did they come? What, how did this happen? You know, it, it was really for me about like being very open about the fact that I don't know anything and how, where's the dream team of how to get this done. So I went to like the district capital and met with one of the head doctors of the hospitals there. You know, there were a couple random like Swiss hospitals in the middle of Cameroon, traveled to a couple of those and was like, where are you getting your meds? What's your markup? How often are they coming? And the big issue with these medications is it's not necessarily that they weren't coming in the port of Southern Cameroon. We weren't effectively getting them up the country. So, you know, it was a lot of piggybacking on the Swiss hospitals, piggybacking on the local provincial hospital and asking how much I could take, at what rate I could take it. Um, but what ended up happening countrywide is when we were all out of amoxicillin, we were all out of amoxicillin at the same time. And I just didn't have the resources or the power to call it France, which is where all the medications were coming from and be like, send us more. So that's kind of a supply chain issue that you know, I think with time and transportation will go ahead and improve itself. But really, we were getting them from the district hospital. And it was me and a team of a few people who were getting in a van, you know, once every three weeks. Um, but it was like I had to learn how to do inventory and like what's the appropriate markup on a medication and not to mention training and making sure that we were not giving meds in the wrong amount to the wrong people and making them sick you know, or making them sicker or anything like that. So, me, you know, medication's a, a very fragile business. Pharmaceuticals, you got to be really careful. Uh, so it was, I had a board that was compiled of a bunch of really amazing doctors and health physicians, and they kind of guided me through the whole process. Wow, well, like funny. you said, you said it's a combination of diplomacy, diplomacy repetition, and then what was the third thing that you said? Being that a pain in a lot of people's <laughs> friends. Like, <laughs> sleeping on their front porches, and, and which I did a couple times. And I'm like, I'm not going anywhere. I was yeah. like, my bed isn't comfy, so I'll sleep right here. I don't care. Right, like not taking no for an answer. Right? Exactly, exactly. So you slept on people's porches in Cameroon, Africa. Well, you know, by the end, by that second year, you start to, please don't tell my parents, I hope they aren't listening to this. You start to take liberties because you start to, it's amazing the way you transform. I started to wear the clothing, right? Like wearing khaki pants from J. Crew is really hot and it didn't, my clothing didn't match the environment anymore. So I started to get local fabric and make local dresses and, and you start to, literally change to your core you start to talk in for full day and think in french and i wouldn't see americans very often so it was almost like a survival thing in some way but i just stopped being apologetic there towards the end i was just like i am your people we are a family i'm going to speak a bit more frankly than i did so that level of persistence yeah it was like being really annoying and sitting on people's porches i felt so safe there in the end i really did like safety was not an issue so Wow, that's crazy. And so at the end of your two and a half years, you have this women's clinic. It has drugs. Mm -hmm. Then what? So my whole thing was like sustainability, sustainability, sustainability. Like I saw so many Peace Corps volunteers and this was kind of the tale, unfortunately, of a lot of Peace Corps volunteers after you leave the project crumbles. And when you are the catalyst that drives a project, that is most likely what's going to happen. So I had to design a team that was just as excited and just as invested, like, you know, like stakeholders in this pharmacy. So um, I found a few people in the village who I would trust, like with my own children when I have them one day. And uh, they took it over. And what they got really excited about is that this whole idea of what percentage can we take off the top, you know, in terms of actual payment to you, the better it does, the more money you make, what percentage has to be reinvested. People got really excited about that concept. That was a really foreign concept to that village. Most people make money and they spend it and then they can't figure out why they don't have money next week. You know, it's kind of a sophisticated concept, reinvestment. So this, the, the key to sustainability for me was, was teaching the importance of reinvestment and that reinvestment equals growth and growth equals revenue. And you want revenue. And that's, I think, what really made it sustainable. So you're yeah, teaching but, economics over there, too. You're doing all the stuff. I'm telling you, everybody's like, Brooke, the Peace Corps to an MBA. And I was like, if I broke it down, I think you'd get it a little bit better. There was such an entrepreneurial nature to all the projects that we did uh, that made it very kind of business oriented. 
Yeah, that I mean, that's amazingly business oriented. So then you're obviously the women's clinic has been sustainable and has been growing. And then mm-hmm. after that, you came, you went to East Hampton after that, or did you do something <laughs> else after that? So I came, I came, little- I came up to St. Louis and just like was not prepared to handle some Peace Corps volunteers transition back pretty easily. Some of a very, very difficult time. I leaving my village, I just felt like I was leaving like a piece of myself and I just could not handle it. I was doing very strange things. I was not comfortable in furniture because like in a lot of places, you know, we sit on carpets when we went to people's homes. So my parents would be having like a dinner party and I preferred to sit on the floor, which is not socially acceptable. My mother would be like, what are you doing? And, <laughs> and you know, there's no, there's not a lot of functioning plumbing. So everywhere we went as Peace Corps volunteers, we always had a, to- a roll of toilet paper. And everywhere we'd go, if we were going to Walgreens, I'd be like, mom, I'd peek in the bathroom and grab a roll of toilet paper. And she'd be like, there is no need to take that to Walgreens. <laughs> like yeah. weird things. And, you know, people want to hear about it for a few minutes. And then they'd really like to talk about what's new and current and what happened with them. And which is absolutely valid, but I needed more transition time. So I work for a startup non-for-profit here actually in St. Louis for a little while, was in New York for a little while and called up, um, had a great contact at Helen Keller International, which, you know, is kind of like a global fighter of blindness and was like, I will come work for you as an intern, but please get me back there. I need to get back mm-hmm. somehow. And they're like, great, you want to go work in Senegal. So I moved back to Africa only after being back in the States for like four months. My father almost died. Like literally almost killed. It was terrible. Um, And I moved back to Senegal and lived there for about seven, eight months. Uh, And then eventually, once I proved myself as like an intern, I got to do the most amazing projects. I got to do grant writing and um, a lot of HR audits in all of our different offices. Uh, They finally called one afternoon and were like, we'd like you to be back in New York. So I moved to New York and worked at their headquarters. That's great. So when you first got back from uh, Cameroon, you almost had like a reverse culture shock, huh? I did. Is that you know, common for Peace Corps? Is that common for, you know, as volunteers come back from the two-year Peace Corps stint? It's super common. In fact, they sent all of our families literature on, like, how to cope with, like, your child being back or your spouse being or, like, you know, whatever your relationship was. Mm-hmm. Because we were just so out of it. Like, I had never seen an iPhone. I was on the airplane. I remember sitting next to this man coming back, and he was Googling something on his iPhone, and I looked at him. I swear to God, and I was like, where are you getting the internet? Like, I skipped out for two and a half years on technology and how quickly that moves. We were just behind. And the day we got back was the day the Bernie Madoff scandal broke. And the economy was just like, it was just very terrifying to come back to like home, the beacon of like non-corruption and and efficiency. And to come home and to feel like to a certain respect, things were falling apart, which is very unsettling for a lot of us. So I know a lot of my friends had a difficult time coming back. And, you know, a lot of them have really stayed in that non-for-profit Um, USAID, government, United Nations track. And that's kind of what keeps everybody grounded and not going a little crazy. Um, Most of us kind of stayed in that general realm as opposed to going down more of, I guess, a financial track. (laughs) You can see, you can see that would be clear, you know, clearly why you do that. Because it just, you have this, it's almost like, uh, I mean, it's a different calling, you know. It is. It's, It's a passion. You know, you don't do it for 27 months if you're interested. It's like there's something in you that like devoutly feels like some sort of divine, I don't know, for different people, it was different things, but there were plenty of opportunities to quit. Every day is an opportunity to quit. And the reason why you stay is because, I mean, you really, something is in you. So to come home and to like, let that die, it's not really practical for a lot of us. You know, we just had to, we've all kind of harnessed it in different ways. And by I say we, my group of 30, you know, who came back together, we're all still so close. I mean, you can imagine the bonding experience. So um, I'd say about 90% of them live in Washington, D.C. and do things that put me to shame absolutely put me to shame I like they're fighting for women's rights in Kenya and doing all kinds of crazy stuff so it so sounds like you yeah there's nothing you, you're you're doing okay pretty well for yourself it sounds like it, I'm, it, doing okay. I'm, do, yeah. I'm doing okay I mean I love I love Olin and I'm, I'm definitely you know I love Washu and I'm, I'm definitely finding my own path um but there is a stigma out there which is why I'm so excited for hike for kids but unfortunately I think MBAs tend to get a bad rap for not being super socially conscious driven individuals that the programs don't teach giving back or like philanthropy the programs teach make money be efficient work for mega corporations and especially what i found at like olin and washu that is not really the environment at all there's certainly an element of that but just as many classes as we have in like mergers and acquisitions we have classes that are called corporate social responsibility so Um, it's tough for me though, to, I have to be honest, to explain to my whole Peace Corps gang, there is a level of confusion of, did you sell out? Why are you getting your MBA? And for me, 
I believe, like, I want to stay in international development, and that's what I believe. But I think it all starts with job creation. And I love the United Nations, and I absolutely, you know, adore what the United States government does in so many of these countries. But I question the sustainability element because they don't have jobs. You know, how can we ever walk away? How can people ever support themselves? So just briefly, I mean, obviously you were in New York for like a year and a half. Mm -hmm. What was the work that you did with Helen Keller International or some of the projects you were most proud of? Um, So I was the human resource and operations associate. And what happens for a lot of these non-for-profits, especially like the global ones, they expand so quickly. For example, like we we just stumbled upon a $20 million United USA grant and we're rolling it out you know, programmatically and had no overhead sort of support. So I was sent to headquarters to work as a liaison between all the 14 West African, no, it was 12 West African countries and figure out how to HR wise and operations wise, make sure things were flowing, that we had minimal legal liability, so much stuff. And the HR department was only three people because we just hadn't caught up to what was happening programmatically in the field. So I did the most crazy stuff from like, no joke, um, plan like the office birthday parties to translate the Cote d'Ivoire International Labor Code to make sure that we were being compliant with one of our Australian employees in Cote d'Ivoire. So it was just like HR kind of stuff all across the gamut. Uh, but I really got recruited. I'm fluent in French and we just have such an issue with the field communicating with headquarters. So I, I did a lot of transition for like senior level employees. That was what occupied, I'd say, most of my time. Wow. Mm-hmm. Do you like that kind of job? I mean, because that's a dip- diplomatic job right there, right? Yeah. To, to, you know, a I, it was a wonderful job. I mean, I absolutely just like adore this company. They do the most amazing things. You know, my frustration, I think, was more with the non-for-profit sector than it was specifically with that agency. For example, like, you know, you have built-in salary increases that like the board approves that are like two to three percent that are non-negotiable. So you can be the greatest employee that company has ever seen, and there's absolutely no salary incentive, none whatsoever. Living in New York City, you know, that was a challenge. Um, I think it's really tough to retain the right staff, you know, when that is your salary structure as well. And I do think that, you know, for 700 employees, having an HR team of 300, you get a little burnt out. Like, I just, I was working crazy hours and working on the weekends, and in the end, I don't know, it was like I needed to take a step back kind of reevaluate and I hope ideally you know to go back into the non-for-profit sector and maybe change some things that bugged me there originally so obviously you know we're coming we're coming into uh, we're probably gonna spend a few more minutes on this and then talk about some chick news All right, but, uh, okay. but uh but I want to get into the school for the blind that you created that okay. I know became sort of your love through this sure. through your work abroad and then also how that ties into hike for kids Absolutely. So when I got to my village, it wasn't necessarily like a huge, I was looking for things to do. You know, those first three months, they're like, figure it out, build something, whatever the case may be. And I was shocked, like even just walking downtown, which like was, you know, like a few kind of shacks put together. But walking down there, the blind people in my village, I I was, it was just very difficult for me because it was so personal were just begging. There was just no other option, right? They were begging and a lot of the elderly people who were blind or visually impaired were being led around by children who consequently were not in school. Was, you know, it was a, it's an issue of dignity for these children to have to walk around all day and beg for money. And I started to speak to people in my village about like, what is going on? What is the perception? But with no adaptive technologies and basically no money in the education system, they don't go to school. And a predominantly agricultural community what what's the, they can't help so they're not really seen as an asset so um i was sitting in my office in the women's center one day and this man named emmanuel came walking in my office like cane going like tip for tat side to side walk in and he sat down in front of my desk and in french was like you and i are going to build a school for the blind and i was like what is your name <laughs> what is going on <laughs> whatever and he and I, I i love this man so much uh we ended up recruiting a team of 20 i say children all the way to adults and we're going into these villages and basically begging parents to have their children, the ones that were forgotten, the ones that were neglected. And we were trying to convince them that people who were blind, I could not explain that I was blind. If I said I was blind, I was just told I was a liar. It just didn't make any sense culturally. So uh, basically it took, it took a lot of negotiating and uh, 20 parents were like, go ahead. I don't want them. 
So uh, we took their children. Uh, they lived in the back of Emmanuel's house, and we started this school uh, with minimal funding, but uh, through an initiative through the Catholic Church and then just uh, friends and family from home. And we started this really fun school that had English classes that taught them how to read and write. Uh, we had we listened to the radio at night, and then we'd have an hour long discussion time and. It was just amazing to watch these people who for such a majority of their lives have been treated less than like animals, basically, go into a space where they were like loved and they were given an opportunity to express themselves. And I mean, like even getting like talking about it, just it's the proudest thing I've ever done in my life. And the problem is just been the financial sustainability of it. You know, the Catholic Church struggles and also what do we do with these children once we feel like they're somewhat educated? Where is the employment is really phase two? Um, I have negotiated with the local Cameroonian government, you know, that is tough to trust. Uh, but basically, if we can prove that this school is functioning for a few more years, we're going to try to really make it part of the local Cameroonian curriculum. And then they will get funding like a normal school in the community, which would be a really big deal for Cameroon to show that they you know, are actually educating people with disabilities. So um, that's the school. And then getting back to Hike for Kids, um, Mike, who I, I, I mentioned, you know, is a product of uh, child abuse. Um, we basically sat down and what we talked about, me helping these children like get out of this sort of environment and bringing them to the school for the blind, Mike was like, there is such a parallel there between foster care in the United States and the Family Resource Center, which is a charity that Mike is very deeply invested in. Uh, he kind of claims, you know, it sort of saved his life in a lot of ways and brought him out of a situation where he didn't feel loved or supported and gave him hope. So we sat down one afternoon and we're like, how can we help both our passions and both of these institutions that have changed our lives? And Mike, like an absolute soldier and crusader, was like, I'm going to hike the Appalachian Trail, <laughs> which I told him he was nuts. Um, Mike has like eight PhDs and masters at this point. So he, he's, he's collecting them. He's like, collecting like PhDs. Coins. You wouldn't uh, And he basically was like, I want to take some time off school. Uh, Washi was amazing. They worked with him. And he basically hikes for these children to create awareness. And, you know, we have a website and we have a Facebook page and we have a blog and, um, you know, our class is involved and we have a faculty student charity event coming up. And, you know, we're going to have a picnic at the end of the year. And, you know, hopefully we're going to have alumni who hike on the trail with Mike. But, Mike is like sacrificing himself to draw attention to this cause that's so important to the both of us. And uh, and obviously, I want to go again. And for those of you, in case there's someone who maybe zoned out earlier, the website is hike for the number four kids dot com, mm -hmm. and the Facebook page, which I think is a bit more like up, you know, interactive in a lot of ways, is just hike again the number four kids. Just type in hike for kids in Facebook, and the page will come up. Now, how do people get funds to you guys? Obviously, that's very important. Absolutely. So, um, if you go to hike for kids dot com and you go to donate now, uh, this is the way we set it up. Mike and I do not start non for profit we did not start a 401c3 you know we are dealing with school and we didn't want to have any sort of financial credibility we didn't we didn't want our donors to have any problem with that so basically what we're doing is the local family resource center here in town has basically created a sub account to their charity when you donate money it filters into that account you can do it through paypal online through the donate button at hikeforkids.com the family resource center holds the money until we have the entire pot and when it is done, I then send a check to the United States Peace Corps, which is going to manage the money that's going into the school for the blind. And the Family Resource Center keeps 50%. So the Family Resource Center is handing all fiduciary responsibility at this point. Very credible. They have major donors, uh, but they're, you know, they're doing an incredible service for us. And, and Brooke, going back to the school, um, I know that you would like to get the Cameron government to, you know, get, 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 get it funded so we can keep going. I was just curious, um, the kids, it, it sounds like it's a bunch of different ages kids, right? And, yeah. and, are they, and are they at different levels of sight vision or are they all pretty much completely blind? You know, it's such a range. I met one child and just by looking at him and us talking, I knew he had exactly what I had. And we had oh, the exact oh. same thing, which was, you know, obviously emotional because of the life he's had. You got to take a step back and just be like, what did I do right to be born in an environment where like never buying a piece of equipment was ever in question and a government that will throw money at me to make sure that I've got the right equipment and then I, you know, and being educated. Um, the problem with a lot of them, though, because we just did not have access to the kind of doctors who could diagnose them, I don't really know what a lot of them had. Um, but the number one cause of blindness, you know, in West Africa is malnutrition in the womb. So most of them came out because their mothers just were not consuming enough vitamin A. Most of them came out legally blind or, uh, you know, totally visually impaired. But, you know, there was a range, but I'd say mostly totally blind. 
Yeah, and to think of, like you just pointed out, when people complain about the U.S. government, and to think about what, what, how your, you know, your childhood and your education all the way through public, I assume you went to public schools? Um, I was amazingly lucky enough and had the privilege to go to private school, and the only reason why I say it was so much of a budget is because my class was so small, okay. and as a result... You know, I just had such wonderful attention and support. Uh, but we moved to St. Louis when my when I was a little bit older. And so my oldest sister is actually a product of a very large public school. And she's such a fighter and did amazing things. And they worked with her just as well and got her some great equipment. So, you know, in the United States, depending on where you're born or whatever neighborhood you're in, we were just so lucky with having a great education system from both private and public. And then, and then you, with that compared, you know, contrasted to what those kids in Cameroon, where they were basically reg, right regulated to the streets, right? Because yeah. their their families didn't want them because they weren't helpful. They were they couldn't they couldn't they weren't helpful. You know, and I I have to admit too that we certainly found some situations. You know, this is a generalization. We went into some villages with just the most extraordinary people, and they had basically set up this one kid I met. They had set up basically a rope system in the field so he oh. could help them all field and whatever. And he was treated very much like a normal child. He'd never been to school, but his siblings had never been to school. You know, it was a small oh. village kind of thing. So yeah. there were certainly circumstances that you know warmed my heart. I wouldn't exactly say they were ideal, uh, but you know there was just a range of treatment. Right. Wow, that's, it's, that's an incredible story. Sorry, go ahead, Jill. Do you have? Did you have another question? No, I think that's great. I I, I want you to be, uh, wrap wrap it. Um, this the whole you know with all these the stories that Brooke has told us, and I just want to I want to comment that just from, you know, going through like I said, your that what you had to do with your uh, um, growing up with your obstacle, and then not only going into the Peace Corps and giving. Shared two years, two and two, 27 months of your life to the Peace Corps, and then all and, and doing the project with the pharmacy and, and over, you know, in Cameroon, and then coming home and working, doing more stuff, you know, here, and then and, and having the hike for kids now, as well as going back over to Africa and starting the school for the, you know, for the blind there. It, that's just amazing. And, and you've done all of this in what I assume like 30 years. <laughs> Something like You're that. very, very kind. I really appreciate yes, it. I actually turned than, 28. Just turned 28. Okay, 28, and you've accomplished all of that already. So Thank talk you. about an impressive <laughs> chick to have on the Crash and Glass podcast. Thank, Thank you very much, Jill. I really appreciate it. So, Jill, you actually have a story about a very interesting chick for our Chick News segment this week, and it's great that we have Brooke here to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is just sort of our one main Chick News segment, and it, it's very, um, it goes well with our with this charitable chick theme because it's it was just something that caught my eye about raising uh, about raising your daughters in Afghanistan and it, it's a, it's actually a new um, documentary produced by the BBC it's the, um, really? the Persian arm I guess you know BBC Persian and it's a documentary called The Trouble with Girls and what it what it goes into or what it kind of talks about in the documentary is raising your daughters as sons which is a, a common practice in Afghanistan. Um, so the main question that, you know, as that the writer wrote about it was like, why do we need to give a girl a boy's face to give her freedom? And so apparently um, a lot of times, and the question is, it comes from a former member of the Afghan parliament, um, a woman, um, and she opted, she had four daughters. Uh, uh, you know, she gave birth to four daughters and she decided to raise one of them as a boy so that if, for basically for her own safety actually so it wasn't so as much so to give the that fourth daughter some more freedoms which was Kate went along with it but it was for her own safety because she had not had any boys herself yet and then she married a man who had what was a second marriage for him and a second marriage for her and he hadn't had any boys yet either no one you know his first wife had not given birth to any boys so in order to if, if she didn't produce a boy for him he would have just left her and found a third wife to give him a boy because if you don't have a boy you just you're 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 you've, you're not successful you're not considered a success so so therefore she pretended one of her daughters was a boy for her own safety because when you are left without a husband 
you can't do anything as a woman in Afghanistan. You can't you, you can't earn an in- income, and so she raised this one daughter as a boy. And I guess it's something that they they the girls are dressed as boys. They're given a masculine ha- haircut and an, a masculine name, and they're sent to the boys' schools because the girls aren't going to school. So they're sent to boys' schools. Allowed to they're allowed to play outside, and they're generally awarded all the freedoms um, that girls and women are den- basically denied in Afghan society. Um, I guess um, the mullahs, it, it says in the article that they appear to turn, like, you know, they turn a blind eye to the practice, so they just, they don't really, um, they kind of let it go, and the families kind of accept this state of, like, a suspended reality that they have, well, instead of having four daughters, they really have three daughters and one son, and so I just thought that it was really interesting, too. I, and I guess most of them have to stop living as a boy when they get to puberty, uh, you know, for <laughs> obvious reasons, but some <laughs> just keep going with it and continue raising them as boys until they're fully grown adults and a lot of times this because they've done this and they've gotten to go to school this whole time they get better they get into university and then they get jobs and then they can be women again but they stay they have to pretend to be boys all the way through you know until they're 18. Well, that was a lot of information, Jill. I think maybe a good place to start is obviously the culture in Afghanistan is almost strictly paternal uh, in most of the villages. It runs on a small village system, and basically you don't own anything as a woman. You are yourself more or less property. And uh, and that's why, as you were saying, if there's no son, you were saying, you know, you don't mean anything. But more important than that, you don't have any rights. You don't have any rights, or you can't own anything, Right. And so then obviously this this practice is interesting to me because I, I don't know about you, Brooke, if you've heard about this happening, but I definitely had not in Afghanistan. I have not heard about this. I have not heard about this, but I could imagine that this is an odd solution to the problem. It's it's a very well, you like, know, you hear about you hear about like lady boys, you know, you hear about like yeah, you hear about yeah. you, hear, you hear about situations in which young men are are being adapted to be female, but I've i never and I'm surprised that they say like the mullahs turn a blind eye because I would think they would find it almost like wildly offensive. Or if the mullahs, I know that there are some who really love that's that's like the leader, right? A mullah is like the leader of a of a of a village essentially, uh, the religious leader, I think, of the well, village. usually the religious leader sort of. And also the leader in charge corruption aside in Afghanistan, which is a whole conversation for a whole nother show. Um, but I'm actually very surprised that they turn a blind eye because of their belief uh, in some cases. But I know that some of these guys really do hold good. You know, they love the women in their community and they want the best for them. And I could see this being a way that they can have the best for the women they love in a time that's not yet quite ready for a certain level of change. I'm so curious, though, as to, like, the details of how you would execute this, because what I noticed, like, in my village, for example, the children were so often nude. Like, people were, you know, clothes, obviously, when they get a little bit older, but, you know, I just think of all the ceremonies we went with new babies and how you could hide one's gender in such a collective lack of privacy sort of community, I find shocking. I don't know how they do it. I mean, obviously, they're pulling it off, but it's right. really interesting. It yeah, I definitely. What's the name of that documentary again? Jill? Right, I- I've got two names for you because I actually found the feature film. I've actually, you know, when you guys said you hadn't heard about it, I had, and I was thinking, how have I known this before about dressing as a boy? But there was a film that I must have found at my local library that, and I watched it. And so there's a feature film that came out on 2003 about this as well. So I'll give you both names. The short documentary that the BBC, you know, just did, and that is, it came out this week, which is why it's Chick News, you know, timely. It's called The Trouble with Girls. And it discusses that long, it's a long-standing tradition, but it's not out in the open, obviously, but it's long-standing tradition, and the name of it is called Baha Posh, which is Disguising Girls as Boys. So I thought that was neat that that was um, the the documentary. And then the film is called Osama, um, O-S-A-M-A. And it's a film that came out. It was made in Afghanistan, and it came out in 2003. And it's about a girl living in Afghanistan under the Taliban regime who disguises herself as a boy so she can support her family. Wow, that is... That Jill, that's a great bit of chick news this week, and obviously so appropriate, you know, having somebody with a global experience that, you know, that yeah, Brooke has. Yeah. And so thanks for joining us, Brooke, and thanks for coming again, my Jill. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. And, uh, and I guess I'll talk to you next week, Jill, and that's it this week for the Crashing Glass Podcast.